Cancel culture has been here since the very beginning. Cain canceled Abel. And guess what? It wasn't with a big scary AR-15, it was with a rock. Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of Fundy Fridays. I'm James and if you're unfamiliar with our channel, my fiance Jen and I talk about Christian fundamentalism and conservative politics on this channel, but in a way where we try to lessen the sting of how awful both of those things tend to be. I like to think of it kind of like if Linda Ellerby were a burnt out socialist for anxious 20-somethings with religious trauma. I really hope that's what you're looking for because we're so happy to have you. Now a lot of the Geninites have been asking me over the past couple of months to update some of the former subjects I personally have covered on this channel. For those of you who don't know, that includes Dave Ramsey, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Paula White, Lauren Boebert, Matt Gates, and Madison Cawthorn. Since Jen and I have a couple of trips coming up at the end of the month, it seemed like a really good time to take advantage of some subjects whose bullshit I'm already familiar with to a certain degree, and go ahead and give everybody the update they've been asking for. So if you are new to the channel, I would recommend maybe going back and watching my old videos on these folks. It's not required reading or anything, you'll probably still be able to get what we're talking about, but if you find yourself confused, start there and come join us when you're done. Now I gotta say that these folks are somewhat asymmetrically weighted in terms of social importance, public interest, things like that. It's like a Baldwin Brothers situation, I think. Some of these folks are just a little more charismatic and effectual than the others, even with all other things being mostly equal. That is to say that not all of these people would have warranted a full individual update episode, but make no mistake, there has been plenty of nasty behavior to go around in these past few months, and all that drama has made for some quite unbelievable headlines which have led to frantic Googling, which drives traffic to places like YouTube, including my old videos, and thereby potentially has the chance to make me some extra money. So I guess you could say that the silver lining to all of this American decline is that Jen and I were able to afford this unicorn pool floaty. And in that fit of ridiculous inspiration, I have decided to forego a traditional update video and instead announce the first annual Fundy Friday's Clash of the Clicks charity auction and big roast. Thank you all so much for coming out to join us tonight, even though you didn't know that's what you were going to be doing. Now, I do have to unfortunately tell you that the charity auction has been canceled. The CrossFit tournament still needs the space for their team sack lift, apparently. We've also had to go ahead and cancel the pig roast as well. We just learned that it was Lauren's team from Shooter's Grill that provided the hog, and given their track record, we just don't feel comfortable risking the health of our audience on another potential outbreak. But we're moving Moving forward with our clash, no mistake about it, and in an effort to make our highly conservative combatants feel as comfortable as we possibly can, we have gone ahead and separated this event by gender. Tonight you'll be seeing updates on the women I've covered in previous episodes, and next month in September we'll be doing an update episode on the men that I've covered. Sadly though, Paula White is in no position to compete with these other two vicious competitors tonight. I mean, she hasn't even brought a scandal with her. The only notable thing about her since the last time we saw her was her husband's appearance on the Stranger Things Force soundtrack. That doesn't get me clicks, Paula. Consider yourself disqualified. And I hope you boys have learned something here today. If you want to step into the sacred ring of the Fundy Friday's Clash of the Clicks, you gotta bring me some real updates. For fuck's sake, you got a whole month to go bankrupt, get arrested, both if you really wanted to. But all you screaming Geninites, rest assured, our remaining two combatants tonight have enough personal animosity, political fury, and overall insanity to keep all of us entertained. They have been chomping at the bit to get at one another for months now, and finally we all get to see the final chapter in one of Washington's most extreme beeps. So it is with both great honor and unrelenting terror that I present to you our main event for tonight, Lauren Boebert versus Marjorie Taylor Greene. We're going to give a little bit of background on our fighters before we jump into the ring, but bear in mind, this episode is really only going to be focusing on things that have happened since the beginning of this year. For anything prior to 2022, I'm once again going to encourage you to go check out the old videos. That's where all the detailed information is, and I worked really hard on them. So, Lauren Boebert is the current representative for Colorado's 3rd Congressional District to the U.S. House, and Marjorie Taylor Greene occupies that same seat for Georgia's 14th District. 
Both of them took office on January 3rd of 2021 for the very first time, swearing in as part of the 117th U.S. Congress that came out of an explosive 2020 election cycle. Both Marjorie and Lauren are far-right conservative loudmouths who have pointed the bulk of their energy and resources as members of Congress towards brand building and political theater rather than actual governance. And because of that, we've seen both of them develop much larger national profiles than we might be used to for freshman members of Congress. Both are also famous for taking an aggressive and vitriolic approach to politics, which I would say has brought them minor fame along with major infamy. I don't want to get too much into it because we're going to settle a lot of this in the ring, but for now just understand that they're both new conservative members of Congress who are making a lot of problems for a lot of people. So with all that out of the way, let's go through the ground rules of our Clash of the Clicks competition tonight. Lauren and Marjorie will be taking part in five rounds of hell designed to ascertain just exactly which one of them is going to get me more traffic with their god-awful antics. The first competitor to win three of the five challenges will be declared the Fundy Update Champion, which is a title I am now realizing might not work. But either way, they will be able to tell everyone that they generated more Fundy Friday's return traffic for anyone else. They'll also get this Fundy Update Championship belt, which we bought at a garage sale because we didn't want to spend a lot of money on this. Also, I know this is all silly, but I do want to highlight too that this is not meant to be a comprehensive competition. I'm sure I'm going to leave some stuff out, and I would love for you to tell me in the comments if there are any juicy tidbits I didn't catch. Also, tell me if you think I end up picking the right winner in the end. I'll try and compile the results and let everybody know in next month's update if the audience agreed with my choice. Good God almighty, this has more pointless pretext than a Duchess of Queensbury match. Are y'all ready to see some combat or what? I can't hear you. Oh, well, that's probably because I'm sitting in my own home office slash guest bedroom far away from anything that could be considered a live broadcast. Oh, well. Let's get ready to watch society crumble. Round one, miscellaneous scandals of 2022. Now we're leading off here because this is the primary place where you generate clicks and traffic for the all-important Fundy Fridays brand. Nobody's going to search for you if you're a loser who can't get your name in the news at least twice a day. I mean, look, take a look at this sad sack right here. You know who he is? I'll give you a hint. He's a member of Congress that I picked with a random number generator. You're welcome to Google it, but searching for middle-aged white guy in Congress probably isn't going to give you much to work with, now is it? So, who do you think he is? Write your answers nowhere, now. Time's up. The correct answer is Bruce Westerman, the current representative from Arkansas's 4th District. But I doubt that any of you knew that because Bruce is boring and he doesn't do anything. The one time he ever did anything of note was when he stole Kevin McCarthy's Civil War sword to protect himself during the January 6th riots. And even then he just ended up hiding in the bathroom. See, Bruce, this is why you're not getting a Fundy Fridays episode. Why did you even take the sword if you weren't gonna use it? See, Marjorie, though, isn't some sword in the mud like old Brucey boy here. She may it until all of about February of this year before stepping into her first major political scandal, attending the America First PAC conference hosted by prominent white supremacist Nick Fuentes. Now notably, this event was billed as a far-right alternative to the mainstream CPAC conference taking place in the same city of Orlando at the same time in February. So Marjorie was trying to double dip in both the mainstream and alt-right cookie jars. I mean, good lord, she even appeared at both events in person, like some sort of extremely uncool Deion Sanders. God, Georgia still has prime time, am I right? I wish he was their representative. Marge would make it from here until about April before she would hit her next roadblock, and this time it would be a much bigger problem for Marge, as voters in her district worked with national attorneys to challenge her candidacy in court. This clip from Good Morning America. Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene from Georgia, known for her often extreme language and for repeating fraudulent claims about the 2020 election, the first sitting Republican lawmaker to publicly testify about the January 6th insurrection. On the stand, Green defiant, saying over and over she did not recall much from the days before the riot. My question is just about whether anybody at all ever mentioned to you the possibility of violence. I don't remember. 
I, I have no idea. I don't think so. The court compelling Green to testify after a group of voters sued to bar her from office under an obscure provision of the Constitution dating back to after the Civil War that could disqualify someone if they engaged in an insurrection or rebellion. Lawyers arguing the case, pointing to her statements ahead of January 6th, like when she told followers it would be their 1776 moment. And this. You can't allow it to just transfer power peacefully like Joe Biden wants. Now, Marjorie did end up beating this case, and her name was never actually removed from the ballot at all. But I think we can all rest assured that there were a lot of Republicans who were itching to find out who the first one of them to testify about January 6th would be. And given what we know about Marge, I'm sure that a lot of hand-wringing was done when it was her number that ended up being called. In more recent news, Marjorie has dusted off her Necronomicon and resurrected the political career of one Milo Yanapolio, or whatever his name is, I honestly don't want to know. Jumanji! Oh, it worked! I've seen horrible things! I've been to the Lake of Fire! Milo has been serving in the Green Congressional Office since June of this year in a summer internship capacity. And this does mark his formal return into the world of American politics. Now, Milo claims he had to be coaxed out of retirement for this gig, but given the last information we have regarding his financial situation, that seems very hard to believe. Oh, and that doesn't even count his most egregious financial fuckery. Let's all watch here as he takes a page from the old lady in Titanic and chucks his $150,000 gay engagement ring, now dubbed the Sodomy Stone, into the Pacific Ocean as part of a commitment to his new quote-unquote ex-gay lifestyle. Fuck. Stop it. Get some help. So yeah. All that's pretty wild. Now hold on to your hats, because Lauren has managed to somehow drum up even more controversy than Marjorie, and she's coming back with a nasty right to the jaw. Now Lauren took a bit of a different approach than Marge, lying patiently in wait until the beginning of summer 2022, when she was able to release her torrent of madness on all of us. She started slow in June of 2022, with a formal investigation by the state of Colorado into her absurd mileage claims stemming from the 2020 campaign. Now that case is still ongoing, but its most notable now for drawing the attention of the American Muckrakers Pack. You might recall this organization as being the one which released the lewd tape of Madison Cawthorn that we discussed last time. And likewise, they intended to go after Lauren with similarly salacious accusations, this time of sex work and abortion. I found a clip that explains this situation really well, but I'm choosing not to show any of it here right now because it contains semi-nude photographs of a woman who is either Lauren Boebert, who clearly doesn't want them out, or an unnamed and unfortunate bystander. Either way, as I said in my Madison Cawthorn video, I would never want to be part of spreading around leaked nudes, so I'm not going to show it. And I am going to tell you this, too. Having gone through all the information myself, I don't really think there's much to this story. Honestly, it just looks like misogyny fuel to me. Besides, the president of the American Muckrakers Pack, David Wheeler, looks way too much like bubbles for me to take anything he says seriously. Oh, and also, Lauren doesn't need his help making scandal. You know, from here, she would run it back with a double scandal whammy in July. First, Lauren would drop this tweet in mid-July, which received hundreds of reports to the FBI for being a literal terroristic threat to a sitting president. Now, sure, if it were anyone else in Congress, I could see the FBI overlooking this and letting it slide. But something tells me they might want to look into Lauren a little more. Call it a hunch. <laughs> days after this snafu wrapped up, our entire country would see the end of an era as Lauren's flagship restaurant, Shooter's Bar and Grill, would close its doors for the last time. <sighs> R.I.P. to that glockamole. We hardly consumed ye. And as the grand finale to Stop Girl Summer, Lauren would see the public leak of a very embarrassing 911 call placed by her neighbors against her husband and sons. Now, a little context on the incident. On August 4th of 2022, Lauren's sons were seen operating a dune buggy at around 50 miles an hour in a 25 mile per hour residential zone. When neighbors confronted the boys and told them to slow down, they brought this information to their father, Jason Bobert, who then proceeded to take part in some good old retirement 
retaliatory harassment. I'm about to play a short clip from the 911 call, but I do want to highlight this takes place right in the middle of the conflict between Jason and his neighbor. If you're not the type of person who's into these real-time 911 calls, and I totally respect that, go ahead and skip to this timestamp here if you can. That'll help you out. All right, that's what we're showing here as well. Tell me exactly what happened. There's a domestic situation happening right in front of my driveway, and now it, he's driving away, I think, just about okay. fighting. There's a... It's bad. It's Lauren Bobert's jackass husband, Jason. He's running over my mailbox right now. Stop, you jackass! Get the fuck out of here! And he, you said Come he on, man! Over your what mailbox? are you doing? What did we do wrong? I live here. I didn't even... Sir, talk to me. Sir? Yes. Okay, yeah. I need There's some... about to be some shit going down here. Okay. Okay, who is the gentleman that's going to your mailbox? Jackass husband. Lauren. Jason Bobert. Jason. Okay. Lauren Bobert. What's husband. he driving? Yeah, Lauren Bobert, the congresswoman. Who was Jason arguing Everybody with? Everybody in the, the end of your driveway. Okay. His kid was racing up and down our 25 mile an hour street, doing 50 miles an hour in a razor, and then he he told okay. my neighbor to fuck off when he came out to tell him to slow down. And the next thing we know, his dad, Jason, comes down here trying to claim that somebody took a, a swing at his kid, and nobody did. But this guy, Jason Bobert, is as dumb as a post, but this guy is so irrational. So irrational. He just got chest-to-chest, face-to-face, looking to fight, and we're talking about everybody in the neighborhood. And just as a finale to this situation, the local police in Lauren's area decided not to pursue any investigation or charges and stated they would simply let the neighbors work it out themselves. Can someone please remind me what we even have cops for again? So with all that in the bag, you're probably thinking I'm going to give this one to Lauren. She also does get the points multiplier for creative use of Dune Buggy. But on the other hand, Marjorie brought back Milo. And for those who don't remember, Milo is a walking scandal generator who can't go more than 10 seconds without stepping in political shit. Ergo, Marjorie has ensured that whenever I do get around to making my video on that dickwad, it's gonna do even better now that he's had more time in the public eye to mess up. Society's loss? My gain? Point goes to Marge. Round two. Pet causes. Yes, just as Paris Hilton carried Tinkerbell around in that oversized purse for so many years, so too do our politicians often carry around with them pet causes that maintain greater importance than other issues of the day in their mind, and oftentimes can even influence their entire approach to the governing profession. Rand Paul has drone strikes. Barack Obama had health care. Mitch McConnell has the complete and utter destruction of our legislative branch. Some issues just tug at the heartstrings, you know? Lauren and Marjorie are no exception to this rule, and they have committed hard to their pet causes this year in the name of that Fundy Update Championship belt. Now, while one can find an ignorant Marjorie Taylor Greene quote for just about any issue under the sun, my research has indicated two primary pet causes that Marjorie just devotes more energy to than others. COVID-19 misinformation and the complete eradication of trans rights. Now, of those two issues, COVID-19 has most likely been the more damaging one to Marjorie on a personal level. In January of this year, her personal Twitter account was banned due to COVID misinformation posts. She still has the government government one, which I suppose is really good for her considering she's still committee-less, has no friends on Capitol Hill, and is rapidly running out of stuff to actually do. Marjorie is also still proudly unvaccinated, even against the wishes of some in her own family, and often relies on an argument of personal medical choice that she seems somehow unable to apply to the abortion debate. I'm not vaccinated, but I strongly support your freedom to make your own medical decisions uh, on behalf of yourself and your family. Of course, uh, being informed by everything that you read and talking to your doctor. But while COVID may be causing her more personal strife, Marjorie has saved most of her big blusters for the trans people just trying to exist around her. In my previous videos, we've discussed such incidents as her seething public rage towards children interacting with anything that doesn't come coated with a thick lacquer of gender binary. And brought a drag queen in and read books to children. The man, the abomination, that he is 
dressed up like a woman, reading storybooks to children in my public library that our tax dollars pay for. Likewise, we've also previously discussed Marjorie's opinions on the Disney Corporation following their stance against Florida's Don't Say Gay bill and just their general policy of acknowledging the existence of the LGBTQ community. The Democrats are the party of pedophiles. The Democrats are the party of princess predators from Disney, and their identity is the most disgusting, evil, horrible things happening in our country. Since my last episode, though, Marjorie has continued to lean in on this issue and has found time to make it even weirder than it was before. I noted in my last episode on Madison Cawthorn her odd assertion that trans men are somehow to blame for tampon shortages. But in the research for this episode, I was able to gain some more insight into the darker religious motivations that lead Marjorie to the opinion she has. I'm going to tell you right now what is a woman. This is an easy answer. We are a creation of God. We came from Adam's rib. God created us with his hands. We are, we may be the weaker sex, we are the weaker sex, but we are our partner, our husband's wife. Luckily for the trans community, Lauren isn't spending any of her time talking about them. Now, she's just writing bills trying to make it as hard as possible for them to get on airplanes. I mean, you, you, you do get how that's worse. Now, when we last saw Lauren, she was also sporting two pet causes, the first of which was the energy sector. This makes sense. She comes from a drilling state, her husband and her both worked in the industry previously, but some shady business dealings inside the industry that were revealed between her and her husband have led her to distance herself from the energy sector and instead instead focus all of her time on her one true love, gun control. Or rather, the complete lack of gun control. Lauren has made free and total access to guns for all American citizens a central part of her brand since the first time she ran for anything. And in 2022, she only laid her finger harder on that metaphorical trigger. Lauren started off with a warm-up in May of this year with this incredible soundbite. And of course we saw Beto acted like a total jerk and tried to use the deaths of these children as a prop to advance his political candidacy. When 9-11 happened, we didn't ban planes. We secured the cockpit. And watch here in June 2022, where she drops a joke about AR-15s at the expense of Jesus Christ while in a church and then desperately tries to get everyone to laugh along with her. On Twitter, a lot of the, the little Twitter trolls, they like to say, Oh, Jesus didn't need an AR-15. How, how many AR-15s do you think Jesus would have had? Well, he didn't have enough to keep his government from killing him. So... Personally, I think that joke was fucking hilarious, but I'm also smart enough to know not to tell it in a church when I'm trying to garner votes. And lastly, she rounded out this three-peat with another inane jab at every Republican's favorite pariah, the country of Venezuela. We have uh, these amazing groomers for dogs. Well, in Venezuela, they eat the dogs. And it started because yeah. they don't have firearms. They do not have a way to protect themselves, to defend themselves against a tyrannical government. And in the end, I'm going to have to give this round to Lauren. While while Marge is over here losing her Twitter account over COVID and screaming about drag queen story time in an era when most of our grandmas know who RuPaul is, Lauren shed the dead weight of the energy sector and instead focused all of her attention on her one true calling, the right to shoot shit being completely unimpeded in the United States. Besides, we also have recently discovered that Marjorie owns stock in three vaccine producers and, of all companies, Disney. You know what? That sounds like a waffler to me. And wafflers don't get clicks. Point goes to Lauren. Round three. Major verbal gaff. Yes, sir, there is nothing quite like an awkward, punchy, verbal blunder of a soundbite to get everyone's Google fingers a googling, at least to find out what all the fuss is about. From Howard Dean's victory screech to Mitt Romney's lady binders and Joe Biden's weird creepy leg hair, American politics just wouldn't be the same without weird old white men saying dumb shit into hot mics. But Lauren and Marge are here like Mrs. Incredible and Violet to show all you ladies that you don't have to leave the terrible verbal quips to the men. It was Marjorie that would get our gaff party started off in February of 2022 with this spicy spit take. Not only do we have the D.C. jail, which is the D.C. gulag, but now we have Nancy Pelosi's gazpacho police spying on members of Congress, spying on the legislative work that we do, spying on our staff, and spying on American citizens that want to come talk to their representatives. 
For the unaware, the word that Marge was looking for was Gestapo, a secret police force run by the German Nazis during World War II. What she said was gazpacho, which is a Spanish and Portuguese cold soup dish made out of blended vegetables. It's also the name of my second favorite character from Chowder. And most importantly, it is not a secret police force. Lauren was quick to jump in on the action with Marge, though, waiting just a month until March 2022 when she dropped this line on all of us that ended up making the entirety of the American Armed Forces scratch their collective head. After I spoke up, a few of the parents of our fallen soldiers reached out to me, and one of the moms encouraged me to share her thoughts with you. Hello, Mrs. Bobert. I am Shauna Chapel, the mother of Lieutenant Corporal Ah, Lauren was real fast to fix this one. She didn't even take four hours before she released a statement saying that what she had actually meant was Lance Corporal, which is a legitimate rank in the U.S. Marine Corps. And honestly, I kind of feel for Lauren on this one. This seems like a mistake I would make, in all honesty. I mean, the word lieutenant is something that I associate with the military. The word Lance is something that I associate with either NSYNC or the Renaissance Festival. In contrast, Marge just straight up souped the bed with this one. I really predict that this gazpacho line is going to go down with Dan Quayle's potatoes and George Bush's pretzels in terms of great moments in American political idiocy. But yeah, dude, when even the freaking soup Nazi has to brace for impact over what you said, you know you have a truly remarkable gaffe on your hands. Point goes to Marge. Round four, the 2022 midterm election. So all of this leads us to the upcoming midterm elections of November 2022. Lauren and Marjorie both won their primaries by this time by an astounding 27 and 50 points, respectively, and long ago set their sights on their Democratic challengers in the general elections. Lauren is currently up against Democrat Adam Frisch, who I personally do not like whatsoever. He's another boring, middle-class, white-guy Democratic candidate with a business background who likes to focus on how compromising and electable he is. Lauren Boebert is an embarrassment, a nutjob that spews hate, a darling of white supremacists, and a leader of the insurrection. We can't let hate win. I'm Adam Frisch. I'm a businessman, a community leader, and an electable Democrat, and the only candidate with a real chance to beat Lauren Boebert. Boy, that sure was inspiring. Also, is it just me or does he slur his words like Steve Brule? What's the first grambling you do? You go to the best machine, of course, you dingus. <laughs> Furthermore, he just barely beat out a fantastic candidate named Sol Sandoval, an indigenous woman with a social work background and truly progressive views. It's like watching Mike Bloomberg beat AOC in an election. It's just awful. In any normal election, I might say that Frisch's goose was already cooked before they even printed the paper ballots. But Colorado is set to debut a brand new, independently drawn electoral map during this 2022 election. While it really doesn't help the Democrats in any major way, it does do a spectacular job of screwing over Lauren in particular by chopping up her formerly safe Republican district into a much more contestable toss-up with fewer reliable conservative votes. On the other hand, Marjorie's midterm story is quite different. As opposed to Colorado, the state of Georgia still draws their congressional district maps through the state legislature, which is firmly in Republican control and has ensured that Marjorie's 14th district is firmly in Republican hands. The district basically glows so neon red at this point that you could probably see it from space. However, Marjorie's opponent is not a half-assed wet blanket like Adam Frisch. For starters, his campaign takes less of a please vote for me, your church friends won't hate you, I promise vibe than Frisch does, and goes for a theme more aligned with Gerard Butler's latest political thriller. I've witnessed firsthand the damage done by extremism, radicalism, and disinformation. And I won't stand by while people in Washington take us down the same path. The Army Corps values teach honor, personal courage, and selfless service. That's what I'll bring to Congress. I hope you'll join me on my next mission. Now we have to keep in mind, Marcus Flowers is a Democrat running in one of the deepest red southern districts in the U.S. It's probably pretty unreasonable to expect him to fall in line with the Bernie crack crowd. He's ex-military, he's got an 
odd hatred of communism for 2022, and he goes far out of his way to make sure he appears strong more than he appears compassionate. He's also been determined to avoid talking about some more controversial parts of his past, including his former marriage to a Russian national and his opaque private background in military contracting, better known as mercenary work. However, Marcus is someone who grew up in difficult circumstances, who knows what it means to have a hard life, and who joined the military as a means of upward social mobility. He also supports progressive measures like rural broadband, expanding healthcare access to disabled veterans based on his own disability history, and increased funding and support for employees in the elder care sector. Plus, being a cool black reboot of Chuck Norris certainly doesn't hurt, although I guess technically that's just Clarence Gilliard. Also, he put his dog in a campaign ad, and as much as I try to be impartial and fair and reasonable in politics, I just trust candidates with pets more. This is my best friend, Max. We've been together for 91 dog years. He has three legs, and we do just about everything together. So when we launched this campaign, I decided to name him Senior Advisor. All right, guys, who keeps getting into the flyers? What's even crazier is that Marcus and Marjorie have beef going back to even before I recorded my first video that I missed the first time. In May of 2021, Marjorie actually kicked Marcus out of a public speaking event she was hosting with her security team citing him as a threat of some kind. Flowers wants to unseat Green next fall in this Northwest Georgia district. I'm asking you. Shortly after Flowers entered the rally for his opponent, security confronted him and asked him to leave. So my job is to assess the threat. I'm getting to see if this guy's a threat. But I know that her team mm -hmm. saw me as a threat. Why? I don't know. Were you a threat to take uh, attention away from her? You know, that's possible. But that's not what I was there for. I was there to listen. Now please note that even if Marcus loses this election to Marjorie, he still lives in her district and will be one of her constituents if she wins. It was totally inappropriate for her to kick him out of that event, but at the same time I think we all know what she found threatening about him now, don't we? So I guess at the end of it all, what we have here is kind of a case of easy opponent in a tough district versus tough opponent in an easy district. Lauren's going to be fighting less against Adam Fritch himself and more against the changes that have been made to her district, which have reshaped the landscape of this election far beyond what Lauren likely expected. Lauren actually has to win this election. She can't just avoid losing. Conversely, Marjorie is facing what I would consider to be quite a strong Democratic opponent in Marcus Flowers, but her district is so GOP safe that it would be hard to find any Democrat who could win there. This general election is truthfully supposed to be a given for her. In the end though, we have to remember, this little thing is about getting me those sweet clicks and engagement dollars. And admittedly, a Lauren Boebert win here to me does feel like a victory over difficult circumstances. And at the least, she'll be beating a real underachiever of a Democrat. I'm expecting that she wins this election, becomes emboldened by it, and goes on to use this momentum as a means of making everyone's lives even worse than she already has. Yeah, it sucks, but that's what makes it engaging, right? But Marjorie has to avoid letting Marcus snatch victory from the jaws of defeat here. If she wins, it was a given. No one cares, and everything goes back to normal. But if she loses, Marcus gets all of that momentum, and I think Marjorie quietly fades into the background. Fading away into the background does not a Fundy Friday's champion make. Plus, the tiebreaker's kind of important to this, so we really do need it to be even here. Remember, it's not fake, it's predetermined. Point goes to Lauren. Round five, tiebreaker, personal beef and assorted fisticuffs. And at last, we end up here at a 2-2 tie. I know all of this has been just my hokey retelling of their story through the lens of my own obsessive indie wrestling fandom, but you have to admit it just seems kind of fitting. Earlier in the video, we talked about how similar Lauren and Marjorie are as politicians. Both rode the same wave of conservative momentum into first-time political victories in the same year, joining the same Congress. Neither came with prior political experience, and both have tried to carve out a very similar niche as the GOP's next loud feminine face for a new America. 
But they're also just pretty similar people, too. Beyond even just their shared views and the venom with which they spit them, Lauren and Marjorie share some unique quirks that it's just hard to chalk up to coincidence. We noted earlier a bit about how Marjorie applies her faith to the world, specifically when we saw her use it like a sledgehammer to try and destroy as many trans rights as she could in one fell swoop. Well, Lauren has the exact same kind of weaponized approach to her faith as well. The reason we had so many overreaching regulations in our nation is because the church complied. The church is supposed to direct the government. The government is not supposed to direct the church. That is not how our founding fathers intended it. And I'm tired of this separation of church and state junk that's not in the Constitution. It was in a stinking letter, and it means nothing like what they say it does. So the way Lauren tells it, the only thing standing between conservative evangelicals and their American utopia is a tragic lack of force against the rest of us. If you ask me, she sounds ready for a full-scale U.S.-based holy war, and I suspect that Marge would be more than happy to lend her a hammer for the attack. And speaking of evangelicals trying to take over the country, both Lauren and Marge have been found in recent months to have played key roles in the January 6th insurrection. Lauren's name has been one that has consistently come up in congressional hearings and testimonies on the subject, and recently leaked texts between Marjorie and former Trump Chief of Staff Mark Meadows reveal her to be nothing more than a simping apologist for those traitors who tried to destroy our government. This message was found to have been sent on January 7th by Marjorie to Meadows. Yesterday was a terrible day. We tried everything we could in our objection to the six states. I'm sorry nothing worked. I don't think that President Trump caused the attack on the Capitol. It's not his fault. Antifa was mixed in the crowd and instigated it and sadly people followed. But when people try everything and no one listens and nothing works, I guess they think they have no other choice. Absolutely no excuse and I fully denounce all of it. But after shutdowns all year and a stolen election, people are saying that they have no other choice. I defended Trump last night on Newsmax. He has been the greatest president. I will continue to defend him. And you, if anyone attacks you, I hope you are okay. I feel badly for everyone. Uh, thanks, Marjorie. And furthermore, both of them are prone to a very unique kind of political paranoia that seems to just always give them a good shot of getting a noteworthy headline that day. For example, Lauren couldn't figure out any other reason that bricks would be sitting outside of a DC construction site other than them obviously being a weapons cache for Antifa. Likewise, Marjorie decided that the best possible response to getting roasted by Jimmy Kimmel was to call the Capitol Police on him. I mean, come on, Marge, it's not like Jimmy Kimmel runs around with a gun everywhere just waiting for someone to pump full of lead. You're thinking of Lauren. Hell, there was a time where these two seemed to be a terrible alt-right dream team in the making. I mean, do you remember them heckling Biden together at the State of the Union in March? God, doesn't that seem like a lifetime ago now? Well, the very next month in April, these two had to be physically separated by onlookers during a confrontation in downtown DC. Shit, that sounds like a better street fight than Wardlow versus Scorpio Sky. And this is where the real cracks started to show between these two. It turns out that this argument was reportedly concerning Marjorie's attendance at the America First PAC conference we talked about. Apparently, Lauren felt that Marge went too far by taking the time to speak with white supremacists. I know, I can hardly believe it either. Insider reports indicate, though, that despite her public profile, Lauren is actually considered something of a reliable team player in the modern GOP. And she's thought to have possible aspirations of congressional leadership later in her career. Marjorie Taylor Greene, by all accounts, though, is exactly as much of a pain in the ass as we've all come to know her to be. And is fully uncompromising in her Trumpist worldview. Party be damned. But see, what Marjorie lacks in formal power, she more than makes up for in informal power. She almost doubled Lauren's primary victory margin, and against three more candidates. Marjorie sits at number 10 among all active congressional candidates for fundraising, a full 20 spots ahead of Lauren. And Marjorie's district didn't get chopped up and weakened with all that bipartisan nonsense. 
And so once again, I think we find ourselves at an impasse. Who's going to generate more traffic for me in the long run? Is it the rising star who's likely to have a decades-long career in government with which to grab headlines and do awful shit? Or is it the lunatic who can literally be counted on at any given moment to be fucking something up? I truly don't know. And so for a tiebreaker, I'm just going to go back to basics. Combat. Who do I think would win in an actual fight? I mean, it's not that far-fetched at this point. Given what we've seen, there's a very real chance that these two beat the stuffing out of each other for real at some point. And also, I grew up on Celebrity Deathmatch, Deadliest Warrior, and Death Battle. This is my moment, and I'm taking it. Now, it is a bit tough considering the wildly different strengths of these two combatants. Thinking of it in D&D terms, Marjorie is kind of like a barbarian berserker. No brains, no plans, all rage. Her CrossFit background would likely give her a distinct advantage in any hand-to-hand -hand scenario, but anything outside of 10 feet, and I worry she's going to start to struggle. Lauren, in complete contrast, gives me more of the vibe of a stealthy rogue. Tactical maneuvers, political espionage, and an extreme preference for ranged weaponry make up her tactical strategy. It would be of the utmost importance for Lauren to keep her distance from Marge, I think, but if she were able to do that, she might become unbeatable. I guess I can sum it up best by saying, if it were a Hunger Games scenario, I think Lauren would probably beat Marge. But in a steel cage, Marge would definitely beat Lauren. And so, by the power vested in me as the sole owner, proprietor, and embezzler of this organization, it is my honor to announce that Marjorie Taylor Greene is our new Fundy Update Champion. So Marjorie wins the belt, and I get a little bit more money to spend on tchotchkes. The only loser here is America. Have a great weekend, y'all. All right, another one in the books. Hope you enjoyed my little weird approach to these two. After learning that they had to be split up from a fight, I just couldn't resist. I'm going to try and keep this one short because I'm a little sweaty. Uh, thank you all so much again for your continued love and support. Um, I literally sometimes just go and sit and read through your comments and see all the niceness and get a little weepy because it makes me feel so good. If you like what you see here uh, and you haven't already, please consensually smash that like and subscribe button. If you really, really like what we do, hit that little bell icon uh, so you know any Anytime we upload some new content, we're trying to upload at least three times a month. We also have a Patreon if you want to support the channel financially and get access to a little bit more content. I am happy to announce that we have just recently started our monthly Patreon live streams, and we're real excited to get this off the ground. We have a merch store through Bonfire. I always like to tell everyone all Fundy Friday's official merch comes through Bonfire. We do have some counterfeiters out there selling bootlegs of our merch, including, tragically, our Greg Lock car coffee shirts, which does unfortunately mean that if you buy those shirts that aren't through Bonfire, your donation is not getting to those wonderful organizations. So remember, the only official Fundy Fridays merch comes from Bonfire. Other than that, as I say every time, please try to get out and do something kick-ass this weekend. You deserve it, even if depression and anxiety or whatever it is has been kicking your butt and keeping you in the bed. Try and roll out and do something good for yourself. You deserve it. I love y'all so much. Take care, and I'll see you next month when we take on the men's updates. President Ronald Reagan, I'm not looking for zombie Reagan to come and save America. Uh <laughs>